Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about membrane structure and function. The plasma membrane primarily consists of phospholipid molecules, which is a type of lipid. They are often drawn like this with a round head and two hanging tails. This drawing from chapter two in your textbook shows their structure a little bit more in detail. And here again, we're going to see that the structure determines the behavior. The head area of a phospholipid contains a charged phosphate group. Because there are oxygens in here, we're going to have different pull on the electrons, which makes it polar. Being polar and charged is going to result in the head area of a phospholipid being hydrophilic or very comfortable in water. The two tails are just long strings of carbons and hydrogens covalently bond together. Those are called fatty acids. So each phospholipid has two fatty acid tails. Because carbon and hydrogen don't, neither one of them has a stronger pull on the electrons, these are nonpolar covalent bonds. So they're equally sharing the electrons. Because they can't make hydrogen bonds because of the equal sharing, these are hydrophobic. They do not like water. They're not comfortable in water. Because of this structure in a watery environment like the body, the phospholipids will form a bilayer, two layers of phospholipids with the hydrophilic heads interacting with the water and the hydrophobic tails tucked away in the core inside the bilayer. This results in a flexible and self-sealing membrane. The nonpolar tails form a hydrophobic barrier inside the membrane, and it makes it hard for some things to pass through it. An important factor in the bilayer is the presence of cholesterol. It is comfortable in the middle of the bilayer because cholesterol is also a lipid, so it's happy to be in a hydrophobic area. Of course, we all hear cholesterol and think this is a terrible thing to have, but cholesterol is actually really important in that it gives structure and stiffens the phospholipid bilayer. That being said, we don't want too much cholesterol or our cell membranes will become too rigid. The structure of the phospholipids results in this bilayer, which is selectively permeable. Some things can pass through it and some things can't. The hydrophobic inner core makes it so that anything really big or charged or polar can't get through that hydrophobic area in the middle. The only things that can easily pass through are lipids or small nonpolar molecules because they aren't scared of those fatty acid tails. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. So what can we do about getting things into and out of the cell? Luckily, we have proteins embedded in the bilayer. Here you can see a cross section of the lipid bilayer with the bottom of the picture representing the inside of the cell, the intracellular fluid, and the top of the slide representing the outside of the cell, the extracellular fluid. Some proteins span the entire membrane going from one side to the other, and these are sometimes called transmembrane proteins. They can form channels or tunnels through the membrane, like these two proteins are doing. They provide safe passage through the membrane for things that don't like that hydrophobic core. Other integral proteins are used as receptors and binding to them signals to the cell to react in some way. There are also some proteins that are just kind of hanging around on the periphery and they are called peripheral proteins. So we have a situation where gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide are small and nonpolar, so they can pass right through the membrane. Lipid soluble molecules like some vitamins and steroid hormones can also pass right through the membrane. But large molecules that are polar like sugars or nucleic acids or amino acids cannot pass through the membrane, so they have to take the tunnel through. Ions or charged atoms and they don't like that hydrophobic core either, so they can't go through. This gets interesting because we can keep things out of the cell by keeping the channels closed, or we can reduce the number of channels we even allow in the membrane. Alternatively, we can open all the channels and let things through if we want to. So we can create 
a gradient. So what's a gradient? Imagine you stood in one corner of the room and sprayed perfume. There's a lot of perfume near you, but very little over on the other side of the room. That is basically a concentration gradient, a change in concentration through space. Now, if you wait a while, the molecules of perfume would start to move away from each other, going towards the area with lower concentrations. We call that diffusion, the movement of molecules from a greater to a lesser concentration. Eventually, the molecules would spread out until there was no gradient at all, and we call that equilibrium. There are different types of gradients. When we talk about molecules in space, we're talking about a concentration gradient. You can also have a difference in charge or electricity across the membrane, called an electrical gradient or a membrane potential, and we're going to talk more about that in the nervous system. And the third type of gradient you will see in this course is a pressure gradient, where the pressure in one area is different than that in another area. We're going to talk about those a long time from now in AMP2 in the respiratory system. To recap, so far, the structure of the phospholipids fatty acid tails is nonpolar, which makes them uncomfortable in water. This makes the membrane semi-permeable. Not everything can go through it. Being able to control the movement of polar, large, or charged molecules allows us to create a gradient. We're going to be talking about gradients throughout the rest of the class. In the next video, Transport Across the Plasma Membrane, we're going to be talking more about gradients and moving materials. Thanks for watching. See you in class.